let's get started then. Um, it's wonderful to see people starting to appear on the screen. <laughs> Ruth, it's good to see you. Um, <clears throat> delighted to have uh, have you with us, uh, um, those of you who've been able to join. Uh, this is, I think, about our fourth event of this kind. Um, it is These are book discussions, uh, which are organized with respect to um, recent faculty publications. Um, we're, we're, we're really um, enjoying this, and uh, we, I think we're going to do the same thing today as we welcome Lars Iyer, who has um, been working with us for a few years now. Lars is, um, he, he's, he's, he has a background as a philosopher. He was working in, uh, in the philosophy department at Newcastle and then made a, uh, how can I say, a, tra uh, a transition and became, uh, he shifted into creative writing and became head of the writing program at New Newcastle. So he's, uh, he's, he's quite, a, quite an interesting figure for us, and he has traversed uh, the relations between philosophy and uh, art, literature, um, quite materially by um, passing from, you know, writing some fine books on uh, Blanchot and other uh, important essays, um, and then moving into, in, into, into uh, fiction, uh, creative writing, uh, novels. And these novels are, as uh, as most of you will know, are deeply informed by his philosophical background, which makes them particularly interesting reading and a particularly interesting experience for um, for for members of the EGS community. And I would say that uh, I, this latest one that we're going to talk about is perhaps particularly interesting for the students of the EGS community, where um, we have a student population um, exchanging. Uh, uh, well, uh, we'll, we'll leave we'll leave that to the discussion. Let, let's say it's a, at least um, an intense experience of the abjection of graduate study. Um, so, uh, Lars, uh, welcome and thank you very much for, for joining us. We have, have um, uh, also with us Aaron Aquila, who is um, uh, is recently joined the English department at the University of Malta. Um, I actually, um, uh, uh, there was a link between Lars and Aaron that they may have to explain for us, but I was absolutely delighted when Lars suggested perhaps we should turn to Aaron, um, whom, whom I've dealt with a bit in, in Malta, and uh, he's, he's a very sharp guy, I'm, I'm really delighted that, that he can be with us. Um, of course, the, with, with us also is Nemanja Mitrovic, uh, who is running, for us, running things for us technically, but also has a keen interest in, the, in, in Lars' work. And so he will be joining the discussion. Um, Aaron will, will lead off, and then I'll leave it to um, Nemanja, and then I will um, follow up at the end. So <clears throat> let, me, uh, let me just mention before we, um, before we get started, just in case time becomes pressing, we will be starting in uh, Malta uh, very soon uh, with our um, fall session. We start on the, uh, uh, I guess it's the um, 30th of September with an orientation session. And then on the first, is that, is that right, Nemanja? Are we October 1st. October 1st is the orientation session. Ah, okay. So we're actually starting October 1st and then we run for the next two weeks. And the, the, the seminars look really, really nice. And uh, I want to remind everyone that it's still possible to, um, to to sign up as an auditor for these courses at the at the at our discounted rate. So um, if that's of interest to you, please get in touch with Nemanja, um, and and he can he can hook you up. Um, but these uh, these 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 courses should be should be really good. So with that, let me um, let me pass the the screen to Lars, who's going to say a few words by way of introduction and tell us what he's been up to or. What he thinks we should be up to, and um, and then we'll go from there. Thank you, Lars. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for joining joining us tonight. Thanks, Chris, for your introduction. Thanks to the EGS. A few words setting the philosophical context of uh, the novel Maive. In Plato's Laws, the Athenian stranger claims that there are two arguments in particular that foster the belief in the gods the antiquity and divinity of the soul, and the order of the heavens under the control of reason. No one who has contemplated the heavenly bodies carefully could suppose that celestial events happen randomly. 
and no one could govern the polis, the city, who does not understand that the stars are steered by a divine will and exist in harmony with customs and law. The philosopher, the novelist Susan Taubes observes that this idea of an ultimate harmony between human and cosmic nature runs from Plato through to the, Sto to the Stoics. The conviction that human beings are at home in the universe. This cosmic optimism, as she calls it, can reassure the Stoics even amidst complete disillusionment within the political sphere. If the polis, the city, doesn't provide the laws we want, if we find the laws unjust, then we should muse upon the law-governed cosmos instead. We should become con cosmopolitan, citizens of the larger whole. Stoic contemplation provides the reassurance that the order of the soul mirrors the order of the cosmos. But what happens when this contemplation reveals neither the order of the soul nor the order of the heavens. What happens with the awareness that the disarray of the universe mirrors the disarray of the soul? It is no longer possible to harmonize the affairs of state according to a nomos, a law, that encompasses heaven and earth. The polis is cast adrift. Our condition becomes what we can call disastrous, remembering the etymology of this word, since the stars, the astras, have fallen. Late antiquity saw the arising of a movement of thought radically antipathetic to Stoicism, for which the sense of a cosmos as meaningful whole collapsed. There was no longer a meaning-making connection between human beings and the world. What is called Gnosticism rejects the notion of a cosmic order, considering the world in which we live to be evil, fallen, and meaningless. Whilst there is such a thing as radically transcendent divine meaning, it remains utterly alien or hidden, accessible only to a gnosis available to the elect. Gnosticism posits an absolute dualism. On the one hand, our world, which is at the sway of evil and irrational forces and ruled by the sham god called the Demiurge. And, on the other, the transcendent realm of the true, inaccessible creator god. Gnosticism, some argues, is a fantasy of late 19th and 20th century historians of religion. But the life of the fantasy is interesting. For Jakob Taubes, ancient Gnosticism was a template of all revolutionary critique. It offers a critique of existence as such, manifesting itself in the desire to negate, abolish, or limit the effects of the worldly order. Gnosticism is antinomian, rejecting all laws, including the law of the cosmos. Such antinomianism is lived as an active revolt, as an attempt to live against the world. And what form does that revolt take? It could be religious apostasy. It could be deliberately immoral behavior, thwarting the social conventions of a time. We might also think of Paul's advice to the Corinthians to live worldly relations and actions as though not. I'm quoting, from now on, let even those who have wives be as not, be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions. The characters of my novel, My Vey, PhD students in disaster studies, practice a Gnostic rebellion against the world in a number of ways. Drinking, drugging, doomery, truancy, contempt towards all institutions. 
I say Gnostic and not nihilistic because my students hold on to a version of transcendence as it is able to give a minimal meaning to their lives, even if it is only as a spur to oppose the legit legitimacy of the world. Of course, this view is consistent, actually, with what Sholem calls religious nihilism. Such transcendence is linked in their imagination with apocalypse, which, if it does not redeem the evil of the world, can at least destroy it. One of my characters, Marcy, has a vision of the Antichrist, of the Demiurge, who will be the false messiah of the coming end times. But her vision also awakens her faith in the true messiah, who will actually destroy the world and lead the way into a new creation. Into their midst arrives my version of French philosopher Simone Weil. She, like them, is a PhD student in disaster studies. She, like them, is disturbed by the absence of justice, mercy, and goodness in the world. But she, unlike them, sees this absence dialectically as precisely a sign of divine mercy, justice, and goodness. This emphasis on dialectics was, of course, present in the real Simone Weil, and it's that which makes her work seem close to Gnosticism. Indeed, Susan Taubes drew Weil's thought into conversation with the notion of Gnosticism developed in modernist Jewish philosophy. She wrote her PhD dissertation on the topic and published a well-known article called The Absent God, in which she develops the idea of a religious atheism, as she calls it, of a religious experience of the death of God. This conversation between Simone Weil and Gnosticism, I try to further in my novel, bringing my Gnostically inclined characters into the orbit of my fictional Simone Weil. They quiz her about the silence of God, about her direct action charity work, about contradictions and why we should contemplate them rather than try to solve them, about what she calls decreation and about madness. My Simone claims the crucifixion has never been deeper than today, with general indifference to God, a denial of the interest or significance of the cross. It's only now that Jesus is being put to death in the fullest and most radical sense, my Simone says. Only now, that is, that the illusions of belief can be burnt away and faith must be made to pass through atheism as through a purifying flame. This is a fascinating thought for the narrator and protagonist of my novel, Johnny. Johnny, whose initials add up to spell the word Job. My Job is, a strong, is strongly affected by the suffering and the violence he sees around him in the city of Manchester, where they live, as well as his own fear of madness. My Simone shows him how he might transmute his torment at the affliction of others. God might be powerless in the created order but my Simone shows Johnny how, in the example of her charity work, it is possible to act for God. Compassion, properly acted upon, is God's work in us, creating the meaning that is painfully lacking in our lives. Simone appears to be able to provide Johnny with a true gnosis sought by the Gnostic, the knowledge of God which can give meaning to the world. But this, is, this isn't quite it. It is not actually about knowledge at all. What's needed is to maximize the dialectical power of the contradiction between God and the world, between good and evil, between the supernatural and the natural, between the eternal and the temporal, and to experience them in their harmony. 
what's required according to my way is to deepen the distance between these terms, to plunge yet deeper into evil and finitude and suffering and loss in order to summon their contrary. A task that must, must appear mad, but whose madness is the correlate of the madness of God in creating the world. But Simone Weil, the real Simone Weil, my fictional Simone Weil, is no Gnostic. Where there was dualism, she wants to see ratio. Where the true God and cosmos were set apart, she wants to understand the relation between them, the correlation of contraries. Where there is my character's alternation, between nihilistic churn and rushing apocalyptic ecstasy, there is Simone's advocacy of contemplating contradiction, of what would, for her, reveal a dialectical unity or harmony of God and world, good and evil, supernatural and natural, and so on, thereby overcoming Gnostic dualism. So who wins in the novel? Can my Simone Weil really hold back the disaster? Is the harmony she seeks really possible? Does dialectics work? Can you really pull God out of the hat of Gnosticism, deeply felt? I leave it up to you to have a look at the novel, to read the novel and decide what you think. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lars. That's a very powerful uh, presentation. And uh, uh, after after a few days with the book, it, I, I appreciate it uh, especially. So uh, good. Uh, let let me then pass the pass the screen on to Aaron. And Aaron, if you get us started with this discussion, I'll be most grateful. And, th and thanks again for for joining us. Oh, thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, all. Uh, earlier, Chris asked where Lars and I met. Well, like very much like Michael's house in the novel, we met in the House of Academia, um, which is labyrinthine and expansive and infinite. And in fact, we've never been in the same room together, but we've always seen each other through um, windows, much like now. Um, um, yeah, thank you, Lars. That was that's interesting. Whenever I, I think about my way, uh, there's always a new angle. There's always something new to talk about there. Uh, so I guess I, I, I'll latch my first question onto your presentation, right? Um, with the polis um, and the house, which which bears significant nuance and, and significance in your work. Uh, not only Michael's house, of course, but also the house at the end, the, the house at the center of the ease. Um, and I guess that's that's my question. This this you you phrased it as who wins in the novel. And I guess we can transmute the question to who resides in the house in the novel, who gets to live and who gets to live there. Um, and it's it's a it's an it's interesting how you figure the house. It's it's quite and it inverts the the Greek oikos very much. And it can also stand in very stark contrast with the house at the end of Candide, for instance, where they also ward off evil in that house, but obviously with a very different picture of human suffering. I suppose that's not very clear. So to be pithy, is the house at the center of the ease, at the end of the novel, a vision stemming from Vey's religious atheism? And if it is, does it not, in the kind of Derridian supplementary way, create its own unreality because it is ultimately a vision? And so actually your novel ends on hopelessness, kind of like Candide. Uh, wow, just thank you very much for your reflections and for the question. That's wonderful. Um, OK, so let's introduce these ideas to the um, audience here. Um, thinking about the novel in general, the idea of a house. My main character, Johnny, is someone who grew up without a house, without a home. He was fostered. He grew up in children's homes, be most mostly in children's homes. So he's someone who wants a home. All through the novel, there's a desire for a home, a desire to live somewhere meaningful, where he feels he can ward off evil. For most of the novel, he's living in a in student accommodation, a very impersonal student accommodation. 
He's someone who enjoys living in an institution, like the children's home in which he was brought up. Everything is orderly. Everything is run according to a routine, a pattern. And what Johnny loves most of all is when no one's there. And he, he can enjoy the absence. He can wander around the institution, the student hall in silence, just looking at the dust motes in the sun shafts, just listening to the silence and enjoying the silence. That's what um, Johnny tells his friends he most likes. But we know as readers of the novel that he's yearning for something else. What he wants is somewhere he can, in the Simone Veyan sense perhaps, put down some roots. So he wants to locate himself somewhere, uh, find himself somewhere. In the novel, there's a man called Michael. Michael is a very hospitable man. He's a former dean, he's rich, he's wealthy, he has a big house. And into this house, he invites people who do not have a home. He invites them to live there for a short period, for a long period, and to form with him a kind of family. So Michael wants to constitute a kind of family around him by bringing into his home people who are lost in life, waifs and strays. And of course, it's a spoiler that Johnny gets invited to live in his house with Michael, with my fictional version of Simone Vey. So he, he ends up residing in this house. And this house is not impersonal. This house is very personal. There are people there all the time. There are people there to say goodbye to you in the morning. There are people there in the evening to bid you welcome. So you're brought into the house, as are many guests of all kinds, of all walks of life. It's based on a real place in which I lived in Manchester. It's based on a real place. So who comes to this house? Monks come there. Um, people who have nowhere better to go. Homeless people come there. Drunks come there. Alcoholics come there. All kinds of people come there looking for a sense of what it is to, to be at home, to feel at home. So this is the home in which they live. And it's separate from the city of Manchester. In the novel, the city of Manchester is a very threatening place, a place full of violence. And this house, Michael's house, is, I suppose it's like the, um, the garden. Is it the Epicureans? I've forgotten my ancient Greek philosophy now. But it's a place separate from the city. It's a place where you go to separate yourself, try and put yourself back together. It has a large open garden. Where there are no fences. The idea is that people who are thieves, people who want to burgle you, people who want to break in and, 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 and nick things, they're welcome to come up to the house, to press, press their noses up against the window, and they will see there's nothing really to steal. This place is simply open to everything, open to the elements, open to whoever comes, open to whoever knocks at the door. It's a place in that sense of hospitality. At the end of the novel, at the end of the novel, what we find is another house. And this house is a product, I think, I say I think because I'm not sure even as a writer, it's deliberately ambiguous in the novel. This house is a product, I think, of a wish, of a prayer that Johnny has. Because Johnny doesn't want just simply to live with Michael in Michael's house. He wants to live with a lover, and he wants to live with Simone Weil. And Simone Weil, in a scene in the novel, a scene in which he invites him to live at Michael's house, where she, of course, she, she also lives, in that scene, Simone, in my novel, spurns um, Johnny, Johnny's romantic advances. He says no to him. She refuses him very gently. They bring out in, in Johnny this great desperation, this great need, this great longing. He wants her as a lover. And that's something which was only accessible to him at the end of the novel, when the characters seem to pass through from this world into something else. Is it, is it real what they experience at the end of the novel? Is it something which actually happens? They appear to be in some kind of heaven. Johnny appears to be tempted by different visions of Christianity. Johnny appears to reject them both and go further into this mysterious place called the ease. Into the ease he goes. And the last scene finds him living in eternity. At the top of that chapter, the sign for infinity. There's the infinity sign. Johnny seems to have escaped everything, to have found himself in a, another world, in a utopia, in something which he conjured up for himself through the power of prayer and wishing. There he is with Simone. 
This isn't the Simone we met earlier in the novel. This is a Simone who seems to have forgotten who she was. This is a Simone who, while present in person, no longer dedicates herself, like Simone of the novel, to trying to contemplate the contraries, to try and open herself up to hold her relationship to transcendent God. This Simone is someone who's forgotten who she once was and who needs educating. Whereas before, Simone educated Johnny. Now we see Johnny educating Simone. He will bring her into a physical, fleshy life with him as a lover. And that's what he hoped for. Eros and Agape come together. Is this hopelessness? Is this end of the novel something which is impossibly idealistic? Could we ever have such a perfect existence? Isn't love always full of non-love? Aren't our relationships with lovers always full of moments of misunderstanding, of not quite getting the other person, of not always wanting to be the other person? Don't we sometimes want our solitude as well? Don't we, don't we want to re-find ourselves, to regather ourselves away from our lover? But the end of the novel, it's a dream, perhaps. It's a prayer. Perhaps it's not real. In that sense, perhaps it's a fantasy. It's a fantasy of hope, of wanting to be hopeful, to have the conditions for hope. At the very end of the novel, the last sentence is, Johnny wants to return to the world. He wants to awaken and to return to the world. Is this something which is pure dream, fantasy, illusion? As I say, the ending is ambiguous. It could all just be nothing. It's up to the reader to decide, I think. Thank you, Lars. Yeah, I think you've put it really beautifully there with love being full of non-love. That's, that's food for thought. I'll just ask one more question if I have the, the time. Uh, thank you. So, yes, for those of you who haven't read the book, it's not all um, so serious. The The book is is wonderfully funny, um, uh, slap your knee kind of funny at some point too. Um, and it's especially good for people doing their PhDs or, or doing any sort of further education because you're reflected very well in that. Um, I may look 90, but actually I didn't finish my PhD too long ago. And I was... Um, quite devastated to see that Lars has captured what I felt like as a PhD student so immaculately. Um, so it's all about, it, it's very, um, uh, it's a novel of caricature of academia, um, uh, of everything from from laptops to, to Professor Ballack's to student <laughs> panels, um, you know, so it's fantastic. I mean, in chapter one, there's this very humorous passage, it's very short, um, this is one of the disaster studies PhD students talking. And here we are in the obscenity of the morning where owls in daylight robbed of sleep, robbed of oblivion, forced to open our eyes, our morning selves before the caffeine has hit, our morning non-selves before we've pulled ourselves together. So that's fantastic. Um, and, and uh, of course, this reminds me of something like Love's Labour's Lost. Uh, I had to look up the quote, but there when the scholars make their vows, they also, one of their vows is at least, and I quote, to sleep about three hours in the night and not to be seen a wink of all the day. So there's a long history of caricature there between the academic and the world, right? And the character of the scholar, um, a kind of Cartesian separation of um, scholar and non-scholar, of the of the wordy and the worldly, um, I, and I was just wondering, Lars, whether you had that kind of tradition of caricature um, in your conscious mind as you were writing this, whether you pulled any particular on, on any particular tropes or representations of the scholar in order to make fun of us all, which is fantastic. Um, yeah, and and whether there were any texts that inspired you on, only in this aspect of the novel um, or anything like that, you might wish to comment. Thank you very much for your question. I talked earlier about um, the idea of uh, Gnostic revolt against the world, of how you, as a Gnostic, um, try to live against the world. And one of the ways to do so is through humor, a, but, but a particular kind of humor. I think of it as a black humor. It's a very dark humor. And that's the, the kind of humor 
which is at play in the novels. There's other kinds of humor. There's, there's slapstick as well. But there's often a, a dark humor. And often you find um, this, this kind of humor um, emerging at moments where people feel disorientated. You're not sure what it is you're doing or where it is you are. You can think of the ro late Roman Empire. Think of Petronius. Is it Petronius? I've forgotten all my books today. Um, you can think of the of, of satires. We, we, satires has become wilder and wilder and wilder as empires collapse, as you reach the end of an historical he epoch. So you have this wild humour which runs through this novel and other things I've written. And that humour is a way of um, rejecting the legitimacy of the world. In this case, rejecting seriousness, of not lodging yourself within the world. Um, always humour to lift yourself out of what's happening. And a dark humour, a humour about dark things, things you shouldn't joke about, about death, about suicide, about murder. This kind of humour, which seems to, to run, away from the, run away with the world, go crazy with the world. That's my version of what Paul in the Corinthians calls as though not. So this is humour, which is a dark humour, which is a um, humour which plays itself out of the hands, plays itself out of the laws or the rules of, of, of the way in which we normally behave in the world. Now, the novel then um, is full of caricature, of poking fun, uh, all kinds of um, subjects. Now, traditionally, satire is ameliorative. The idea behind satire is we're going to poke at these things. We're going to point to. We're going to point out these things, and these things can be cured. These things can be. We can do something about them, and we can put the world back together again. So traditionally, satire has that ameliorative um, uh, use. It's about putting the world together again. It's about restoring the laws, restoring order. But the kind of humour which I'm advancing here, which I'm using in my novels, is not intended to do that. It's intended, as I was saying, to carry the world away with it to lose the world in some way. It's a bit like Michael's house. There's a house of humour. The characters um, go to a cafe every morning, and it's called Al's Cafe. And in Al's Cafe, they're, 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 just, they're just woken up. They're, um, they've ordered their macchiatos, which is an espresso with, a, with, with cream on top. You know, So that's what they're drinking in the mornings. And they're waiting for the caffeine to hit. So they're at their most doomy. They don't want to get up in the morning. In fact, they, they, it's not even the morning. It's, it's nearly noon when they get to the cafe. So they're at the most doomy. But in, in Al's cafe, that's where they're um, able to, to, to exchange the darkest and doomiest thoughts, the darkest of all humor. And that's what they, they then bring with them into the university, riding on the bus, going into method class, learning um, you know, they have the, 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 the compulsory sessions on how you should write your PhD, they bring that darkness with them. They have a terrible attitude in that sense to what they have to attend at university. So a caricature, caricature of the university, yes, and the university is another house here, the house of learning, and these characters want to carry away that house too. They want to laugh it, to laugh it down. What they want to do is to release in that institution a kind of nothingness, um, even a kind of nihilism. They want to unleash what they think is there. These institutions, for my characters, do not have authority anymore. They've lost that authority. And what they want to do, what they want to awaken in their laughter, in their humour, is that lack of authority, that lack of groundedness. So that's what they want to bring forward as they go through the university. It's a sense in which the university itself has no legitimacy upon them, has no claim. Now, my students are doing PhDs. My students are um, scholarship pupils. They've all uh, won some scholarship, which enables them to spend some years writing their PhDs. For them, the truest relationship to the house of academia is never to leave it, never to bring their PhD dissertations to term, never to finish them. This, for them, to finish a dissertation would be the ultimate betrayal because what they are loyal to is a kind of nothingness, an ungroundedness, that which will not permit itself to be confined within, the, within, within um, any kind of, within any, within any, within any terms. So what, the, um, what, what they're trying to achieve with the dissertations is to write that which cannot be closed off, cannot be finished. In this way, they'll inhabit the university as its dark 
heart as that which cannot be brought to term, which is not obedient, that's another form of their antinomialism. It's another version of what Paul calls as though not. Thank you so much, Lars. Uh, lots of food for thought there. I've got other questions, but I'll email those to you and I expect a 500 word essay by next Monday. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll uh, let others have that. And thank you so much. Thank you. I presume that answer is going to come in a fragmentary dialogical form, but also. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you, both of you. Um, let me let me now then pass the screen to Nemanja and um, uh, please go ahead, Nemanja, with your questions. Thank you, Chris. Uh, also, before my questions, I just want to say that I'm very happy uh, to be part of this because I'm following uh, Lars's work for such a long time uh now and i want to pose you some questions that you know these were things that um i don't know the answer in advance there is th th these are things that touched me and you know i'm really interested to hear uh what you think so the first question is um related to a certain absence in your work and we got the spurious trilogy and after spurious trilogy we had your versions of uh, Wittgenstein, Nietzsche, and now Simone Weil. Bearing in mind your past, were you ever tempted to create a novel that will, fe that will feature your version of Blanchot? <laughs> wow, that's something, that's some difficult question. For those of you <laughs> not familiar with the work of uh, Maurice Blanchot, uh, Blanchot is a very interesting and enigmatic um, shadow um, across the 20th century. He was someone who chose not to appear in public after a certain point. He only gave one interview ever. Um, otherwise, he was someone who lived a life in retreat, which he felt was consistent with his views on literary writing. So for Blanchot to be a writer meant that you have to withdraw from publicity to hold yourself back from the normal channels of um, promoting your work. And Blanchot's own writing, his literary criticism and, and, his, and his fiction, is of a very challenging kind. Although he was widely, you know, he, he published in in journals that were widely read, um, he was someone who, although you know, his, his work is very lucid, it's very hard to grasp exactly what it is he's arguing. It's something you have to spend time with and attune yourself to to try and have any idea of what it is he's about. And of course, being such an enigmatic and fascinating figure, being someone who, whose writing is mysterious and tantalizing, he would be wonderful to write about. But I've never dared to do so. I've never dared to do so. One day I wouldn't mind writing a book simply called Blanchot. But what kind of book would that be? Blanchot's work is not known for its humor. There's very little humor at all, analysis of humor in Blanchot's work. And I wonder what it would be to present a thinker like Blanchot in our times today. What would it be for me? And I live in the UK. I live in Newcastle upon Tyne up here in the, in the UK. What would it be to present a figure like Blanchot? Now, we live in a culture which is not particularly literary, not as it used to be. We live in a culture where most people I know don't really read books. My colleagues in creative writing do. But beyond creative writing, beyond literature, the school of literature where I work, um, even in the university, not many people are reading fiction or poetry. And if you go around people's houses, if you socialize with people, even in academia, the conversation is normally about you know, box sets of various kinds, as we used to call them, TV series. So a society in which literature has been marginalized in many ways, and it's no longer, it no longer has the presence they once had, and the, 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 the great literary signatures no longer have the prestige they once had. These great names have become ossified, remote from us, I think. So in this world, if I were to write a novel about Blanchot, it would have to be a comic novel. It would have to be comic. It would have to be what we might think of as low cultural. So it has to be a, a novel which is very different to the, the loftiness that we find in Blanchot's work. So it would be a low cultural novel, a novel set in our times, a novel of futile slapstick in some way. One day, one day, maybe I'll write it, but you know, uh, the task is, is daunting. It's really daunting. I spent a lot of time trying to read and understand Blanchot, but I still feel I have a very poor grasp of his thought. So maybe I have to wait, maybe another decade, maybe two decades if I'm still alive. Then and only then as a capstone of my life's work would I have to produce something. But the work I would produce would be deliberately minor 
and irreverent and foolish and extra stupid, even more stupid than the other novels I've written. Thanks, Nemanja, for putting that thought into my head. <laughs> no problem, Lars. Thank you for your answer. And actually, my second question is related to that first one, and is um, it is about that humor, irony, and self-irony that is uh, ever-present in uh, all your literary works. However, what I found really interesting is that one part of my way has a different tone than the rest of the novel. That's my perception. Uh, so there's always irony and humor in uh, discussions between friends from uh, disaster studies. But I felt that this irony is not present when they discuss the tree of life. Why mm. these four pages when they discuss uh, the tree of life and why this is the case if I see it correctly? Yeah, so in the novel, um, I wanted to have these set piece discussions. This, be, this has been my literary ambition uh, for many years, since I read uh, Thomas Mann's The Magic Mountain. In the Magic Mountain, you have these great uh, discussion set pieces between Tetembrini, who's, um, who's a humanist, really, and NAFTA. And NAFTA's a Jesuit communist. You have these great set pieces where these characters um, discuss um, issues with each other in front of Hans Castorp, who's this um, young engineer who's, who's, who's um, spending time in a sanatorium up in the Swiss mountains. So ever since I enjoyed those dialogues, and also the dialogues we find in the work of Dostoevsky, I've wanted to recreate my own. I've been dying to do this. And it's something which I found very, very difficult to do in writing Simone Weil. So Simone Weil, there's about five different discussions, long ones, which are quite serious. There's one in a restaurant where they're discussing, um, is it the meaning of suffering? Another one where they discuss politics, and what political options there are today. And there's a discussion of um, Terence Malick's film, the Tree of Life. This is a film you might have seen. It came out in 2012. My character is called, I forget, I forget his name now, but anyway, his initials are, um, give us Job. If we look at The Tree of Life, the same thing with Tree of Life. The character's name, played by Sean Penn, is Jack O'Brien. So he's Job. And the whole film is a recasting of the book of Job. And we see that actually in the opening epigraph, which is from, um, from the book of Job in the Bible. And the Tree of Life famously has this, this scene. But what happens is um, we track back to the beginning of the universe and we see everything unfold. We see the stars form. We see planets form. We see life on Earth evolve. And over 16 minutes, we see and we, we move through jellyfish swimming around, sharks, through dinosaurs, CGI dinosaurs, to human beings. And this, of course, is the version of what we find in the book of Job in the Bible where God presents these pictures, these pictures of nature to, um, to Job himself, to try to give him a sense of the meaning of his suffering, what, what role, what place his suffering has in the creation as a whole. So these discussion scenes were, for me, um, very important to try and get right in, in, in the novel. And that I wanted to show that you know, postgraduate life, studying as a, as a student, is actually a very serious thing too. And although my characters lark about endlessly in my fiction, I wanted to give a real sense of what, it, what intellectual discussion might look like. And this is, this is part of postgraduate life. So, you know, um, postgraduates in my work, um, and to, to ask this other question, to answer this other question, for me, I think about um, in relation to Plato, the Plato Symposium, um, they have the figure of Eros. If you read the Plato's great dialogue symposium, you have, you have Eros, who's presented by Socrates as someone who's between poverty and plenitude. Is it his father is, is, is the embodiment of poverty? His mother's the embodiment of um, plenitude? Or is it the other way around? I can't remember. But Eros is presented as someone who's wandering, who's not in possession of the truth, who hasn't reached the truth. Who has, Eros hasn't found his destination. Eros is, in, is someone in perpetual desire, always looking for something, always seeking and never um, actually grasping what it is that he wants. And for me, in that sense, Eros is the embodiment of the postgraduate, is the embodiment of what it means to be um, a student, someone who's studying. And the word studies is linked etymologically, that word stupidity. So if you're studying, if you're studying the right way, 
you always feel yourself to be stupid in some sense. There's all this stupidity in you. There's always something you, you're trying to address, to correct. There's a lack. And there's this notion of absence you mentioned earlier in the manual with respect to Blanchot. There's a larger absence. So this is the point then, that the figure of the postgraduate is of someone who seeks. Someone who seeks something which does not have a term, which does not have an end point, which does not lead to any kind of finality. And that seeking is um, em embodies as part of it a seriousness, as well as a self-irony, as well as irony, as well as humour. And that's what I wanted to capture in this book, but actually also in the others too. But in this book, I wanted to have my Thomas Mann moment, my Dostoevsky moment, where I try to seriously present what intellectual discussion looks like. Well, I really love these, these parts uh, of um, uh, actually every work of yours. But also something that I love is uh, the role that music plays in uh, all of your novels. And um, connected to this is something that we mentioned uh, before this meeting, that playlist that uh, you provided when you did the uh, interview for uh, Quietus, the playlist for uh, My my Way. However, I read also your Washington Post interview, and then um, this question of mine will be a kind of question, kind of suggestion. So you tell me what you think. You said, uh, in uh, that interview that your new novel uh, will be set in a philosophy department, but strongly centered on romantic relationships. Uh, bearing in mind this sentence and uh, the role of music uh, in uh, your work, I wanted to ask, do you maybe plan on situating this novel in Bristol? Ah, oh, interesting. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because of Sarah Records, all this stuff at the beginning of 90s that lasted for uh, three years. And all these bands, you know, that have that, that are very sensitive and they were singing about longing and yearning, which is something that you said that you want to achieve in your new novel. Mm, thank you very much for the suggestion of Bristol. So Bristol and Sarah Records, this is, um, Sarah Records are known for sort of indie, in, in indie music and actually my way is quite a harsh about indie music really that the, the indie music is the object of satire it's very easy to make indie music the object of satire if you think about it back in the 1980s when um, indie music emerges out of new wave one of the things we, we, we find in, in um, indie music is a kind of um, regression to childhood so you find um, indie music often about um, childhood um, innocence um, uh, a sort of fumbling incompetence a deliberate presentation of um, romantic uh, foolishness, even of celibacy. Think of the Smiths. So indie music is often about being awkward and fumbling in romance. And this is something we, you know, it's easy to laugh at indie music for this reason. Um, it, you know, it can be, if you think of a, a band like uh, Bell and Sebastian, if you think of the, the, uh, the album, um, the, the Sinister album, whatever it's called, Are You Being Sinister? Whatever the name is. Um, it's it's almost it's a regression to childhood. So for me, indie music is something easy to satirise. I, I never really thought about it until now, Nemanja. So I thank you for that. Maybe it needs to be re rehabilitated in in my fiction. But when I think of Bristol, I think of one person, and that is Tricky. I think only of Tricky. I love Tricky's work. Just today, I was reading an interview with Tr Tricky. I think of Tricky very often. So for me. Um, Bristol is tricky. I actually based a scene in, in my way on a, on a scene in um, Tricky's autobiography where he remembers going, he remembers going to, for curry in, in a part of Manchester, which is called Rushome, which is full of these curry houses. And when he goes in, Tricky, um, when Tricky goes to a restaurant with his, with his family, he's treated very well. He doesn't just have normal papadums. He has extra large papadums. He doesn't just have normal size curry dishes. He has extra large curry dishes. Um, and that's because, you know, Tricky's from a family of gangsters who are treated very well in Bristol and in Manchester. So that would be my Bristol. It would be Tricky. And I, I look at Tricky with almost holy awe. I look, I mean, he, he, he would hate that. He doesn't like to be treated in that way. But I look at him as a, you know, for me, he's a mesmerizing figure of infinite depth and intrigue. But actually, the new novel, I'm not going to be um, writing about Bristol. It's going to be set in Newcastle upon Tyne where I live now, 
and I've, I've written a fair amount of this novel already. And what I wanted to do here is to think about speech. You know, my ambition has always been to try to write a monologue. So my novels are very dialogical, but what I want is a character just to speak and speak and speak and speak. And my model for this is a novel by Thomas Bernhard, uh, translated as Gargoyles. And uh, Thomas Bernhard's Gargoyles is a novel uh, where uh, a doctor and his son, his son's a grown-up student, he, um, they're wandering around this, this, this mountainous part of Austria, very remote and rural. They're wandering around this part of Austria, meeting various people who come from unfortunate lives. These people are very sick. These people are often deranged. And the doctor and his son talk to these people, and the doctor um, tries to cure them. Well, they come to a, a castle, and in this castle lives a prince. And this prince is quite deranged. And the novel, until that point, has episodes, it has characters. The last half of the novel is given over to a 100-page monologue by this prince. If I remember his name properly, it's Prince Sorau. And that's what I want to reach in this next novel. What I'm desperate to do is to have just a voice, one voice, talking for pages and pages and pages and pages. So that would be the outcome of my romantic story. Uh, it would be a voice speaking and speaking and speaking. Whether I can do that, I don't know. I always aim at this. I always fail. So who knows? Thank you for the, thank you for the question. Uh, you know, my final question is now related to something that I heard um, uh, this summer when you were teaching at the EGS. And uh, this is something that you said to students who were present in your seminar. But I want to ask you that question so that it was so good for me that I want to have it on record. And that question is related to the beginning of your literary career. And uh, the question goes, what role did the mold have in the beginning of your literary career? Uh, thank you very much for remembering the summer. I'm not, not sure what I said about the, the mold. You know, autobiographically, I was living in a, I was living in a flat um, here, in, here in Newcastle. I was overtaken by damp, by mold. Now, it, it was, it was quite, a, quite a process. It was quite something. Because I knew that the flat when I bought it had an underground river, literally a river running underneath it. It's a culverted river in Newcastle. It actually becomes quite a big river when it, when it, when it reaches the Tyne. It's actually a sizable river. So I knew that was there. I also knew that um, there, was a, there, there, was an, there was an issue with... Um, with the walls, they, they were they were kind of damp when I moved in, but nothing prepared me. <laughs> no, nothing prepared me for what happened <laughs> when when after a while in the house in the in the flat, um, I noticed you know damp creeping in all over the place. Look, I I had um, a new kitchen put in. I thought, okay, you know the outside was rendered, the damp was contained. Now it's the time to refurnish the flat. Everything was sopping wet. Everything was rotten. There were there were there were snails in the flat. There was there was you know, black mold everywhere. You breathe in spores. These 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 spores you could almost you know, they're almost as big as I don't know. They, they were they were almost <laughs> visible in the air. These spores. When you breathed out, when you exhaled, you could see the you could see your breath in the air in the moldy air of the flat. So I thought I had done with this problem. I thought I'd solved it by rendering the outside. Uh, a, a layer of um, what is it, what, render on on a brick. I thought that was that was done. I thought that was solved. I thought, okay, this is it. So I I installed the new, new kitchen. I invited my friends around. I said, yeah, come around. We'll celebrate. Uh, the flat isn't as damp as it once was. It's probably healthy to be here again, relatively so. And that night, um, as we were having our dinner party, I noticed a pin prick in the top um, right hand corner of one part of the kitchen. A little pinprick, a dark um, um, pinprick. The next day, it had grown to the size of a tangerine. The day after that, to the size of a beach ball. Now it's a three-dimensional thing spreading outwards. It spread. It spread further. And soon the whole kitchen was completely, utterly um, wet, saturated with damp. I called a plumber out, and he gave me a diagnosis. He said, well, I'm not sure what's wrong here. It could well be a leak from upstairs. So he went upstairs and had a look. He said, yes, there's a leak. There's probably more than this, but I'll fix the leak for you. So off he went and fixed my leak. And I said to him, okay, well, thank you very much for helping me. Um, 
can I, can, I, can I pay you? He said, I won't take any money. He wouldn't take any money from me. He felt so sorry for me because of the flat and the, the condition he was in. He took no money. It's a true story. It's, it's, actually, it's actually in Spurious, the novel. So um, he took no money from me. Anyway, so the whole ca kitchen had to be dismantled. It had to be pulled down. And damp spread everywhere in the flat. And the rest of the flat, went, went, the walls were all brown. There's a leak from upstairs. There's, there's, there's rising damp. All kinds of damp um, were there in the flat. And I called, I called in expert after expert. And it was like, you know, it's, it's like some Talmudic process where you know, a, a expert would contradict expert. Expert would say expert one was wrong and expert two was right. It went on for a very long period until, thank goodness, I, 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 made, I made the place look relatively okay. I sold it to an, an investor who had no idea what he was buying and, and the curse went on to him, the curse of the damp. But the damp was part of the condition of my so-called writing career. Because what I did on my blog, which I had back in the early 2000s, I wrote about my I wrote about my damp. I tried to find a language which could um, evoke that damp for my readers. And part of that evocation was a very rhythmic language, a musical language, to try to hymn the, to hymn the um, the damp in in my prose. So my prose then was something which even came from the damp, emanating from the damp. Of course, if you look at the damp. Um, as a Levinasian, then that damp might remind you of certain things. I had, I had a, um, a guest, an esteemed guest, who came from uh, the University of, um, of Van the Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt in Nashville, came over as a Levinas expert. She came over and she was staying there with her, with her husband. And she took a photo of the damp and then she, she put it on her Instagram, wherever, wherever we had in those days, and she said, an ambassador from the Elia. The Elia in, um, in the work of Levinas is matter at its most debased, matter at its lowest, at its formless. It's that from which God made the universe. It's simply rubble. It's rubbish. It's detritus. It's, it's what Beckett would call disjecta. So my writing came about as an attempt to try and evoke the mold, to invoke the damp, and to do so by trying to find a language adequate to, responding to this ilia, this there is, this sense of the world stripped of any qualities. And that's what um, I attribute my literary writing to. The beginning of that writing was the engagement with the horror of damp, ever spreading, termless, uninterruptible, uninterpretable, unpin downable, unstoppable. So thank you very much for that question. Thank you, Lars. That's beautiful. Nemanja, did you want to follow up in any way? Are you? No, no, no. This is this is what I uh, what I had. You know, because you can uh, you can continue uh, if you wish. Okay, I'll actually I I I won't go on quite as long as the others, um, but maybe Lars will go on and um, and then we can we can perhaps take a few questions from the audience if uh, if anybody else wants to wants to come in. Um, first of all, I uh, you know on Blanchot. Um, I, I think there's a lot of humor in in, in Blanchot Lars. I, I um uh, and I, I I think it would, could be really well actually it could be a challenge for you because somehow you have to deal with the the high the high Blanchot so to speak, but then also this very low Blanchot and and you know Thomas Thomas the Obscure is uh, I, I, I laugh in almost every chapter. Um, and my, one of my favorite lines is when he um, he's you know he's, he goes to the home you know where he stays and it's not cl like clear what kind of home that is and he's trying to get the attention of uh, of, of um, I guess it's on at that point already and and he slams the table <laughs> and and then everybody moves off you know getting away from this guy and 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 the the uh, and, and the phrase is uh, which he uses supposedly to himself error de tactique. <laughs> I've, I've I've made a tactical error here, um, and, and I, I I can never read that without you know laughing out loud. And there are other strange things that take on, you know, in La Folie du Jour there are um, the madness of the day that there, there are statements that um, seem to me almost to start to reach that that quasi transcendental uh, um, uh, space that you you touch upon where the where the real becomes. You know, utterly unstable. And I'm thinking about when he when he when he he remarks in passing as someone tried to break glass in my eyes. 
Um, and then he just passes on. It, it, it's it's a preposterous, extraordinary statement. And and you know when I read that with my wife, we, we literally start laughing. You know, and so I you know I, I wonder how how you'd work with that. I think there's an immense amount of uh, opportunity for you. I think that it's uh, you know it's 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 a beautiful um, challenge that that uh, that Nemanja uh, uh, suggests to you. I'm just making that as as an observation. I, um, I, I can I can feel Blanchot throughout your work actually, and, and so maybe you always are writing about Blanchot in in some way, and um, uh, so that might also be part of the answer to to, to his question. Um, I, I, let me go on to something like a, a question that that might prompt you. Um, you know, I I. Um, I, 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 I had, a, had really a great pleasure listening to you this summer in Sasfe, um in your seminar, and and uh, um, I did want to note that for for our auditors, Lars was teaching um, a, a seminar de devoted to the question of uh, creativity, um, and, but he was giving a particular focus to Levinas, and he was treating this um, this topic in relation to questions very close to the ones he was discussing today the theological questions and it was a it was a marvelous seminar very very powerful and um you know I, I have the same feeling after listening to you today that I did after that seminar it's a, you know sort of a, a thrill and a, and, a, and a challenge really really very very inspiring and I I, I was wondering um you know, I couldn't, as you were describing the department of, uh, or the program in disaster studies, I was wondering how, uh, how you might think of the EGS in this context. <laughs> and, um, and, and the reason I, I ask this in the sense that um, I, I want to ask, is the department of disaster studies actually a kind of utopian space? I mean, in, 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 in the, it's actually the opposite, the way you present it most of the time. I mean, with the methods courses, with the, uh, you know, with, with Professor Bollocks and, um, and these, these nightmarish methodological um, uh, uh, programs that they've put in place in the UK. And since I was there, uh, things have just gotten a whole lot worse in that respect. And it's, um, it, it, it's really, <laughs> it's really quite, it's, it's, it's worthy material for you. Um, but you do have this very strange concept of a department devoted to, uh, with its 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 core text, being uh, the writing of the disaster, and um, and it it is populated by students in a state of, uh, as I said, I called it abjection, um, in, in, in living out a form of disaster, um, which and and, and and with a kind of purpose, purpose without purpose, that you described very nicely today. And uh, but, but so I was just, it made me, it made me, well, th the reason I'm asking this is that there is a thoroughgoing critique going on of institutions here, as, as you suggested, com completely thoroughgoing. And yet you are, to me, strangely, not strangely, but beautifully caught up with this figure of the postgrad student. Who's writing a dissertation in such a context? There's, it, it is, uh, and I think I understand that. Um, I, I just, I, I'm just wondering about the status. So my question is, 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 a, is a question about the 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 status of the, this this department of disaster studies. Um, and I'll just add one one little item. You can see I'm very very fragmented here, but um, my as I was reading, I constantly turned back to this question of what kind of program this was. Is it a failure? Is it something necessary? Is it, you know, all, all kinds of questions. But um, I remember one day as I was addressing graduate students early on in my career and in, in, I was at Binghamton University. And one day, I don't know, I was in some strange mood. I think we were reading Bataille or something. Um, but I suddenly launched on a, um, a, I don't know, a kind of, well, it was a lecture in which I tried to call to them and I said, you need to remember that you are the most abject creatures on earth. Um, you have no authority. You have no respect. You have no money. Your future is totally doubtful. Um, the the uh, uh, the conditions are almost impossible. And that also makes you the freest people in the entire university, which is where thought should be happening. 
and um, and I said, you have to embrace this. You have to embrace this incredible uh, opportunity. It will never get better than this. And that was my um, sort of my my argument because I started describing what happens to the postgraduate who enters into the system uh, as a teacher and so forth. And and so I was trying to call them to uh, the, the curious freedom that they have. And um, so I do understand this figure of the postgraduate. I have, I've come to think of a lot of faculty as postgraduates in that form now. I think there's a kind of a survival of the postgraduate in that abject form in certain faculty, although most of them are captured in a kind of a bourgeois uh, uh, servitude, if I could put it that way. But there is nevertheless, a, in the academic world, there is nevertheless a, a, a strange um, play at that freedom, which is is something more than academic freedom. And I, I just, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm piecing together a lot of reactions and, and, and uh, responses to your book, but I, I wanted to ask you about this um, Department of Disaster Studies and what can we learn from it? Um, if if we are uh, um, devoted to a form of academic freedom, as I think we are in the in the PAC division of the EGS. Thank you very much, Chris. Thanks, thanks, thanks for those thoughts. So my characters um, are PhD students who are made to go to methodology classes, as they're called. As many students are today, methodology classes are compulsory. And the idea is you go along and you learn how to study. You learn how to focus yourself, how to devote yourself to a particular task. And my characters can't stand this. They, they think it's awful. But the point is that it doesn't have to be this way. Uh, method classes, methodology classes aimed at PhD students could be very productive, could be interesting. But I think what would have to be done there is to uh, think about this relationship between study and stupidity. This idea that when you're studying, you're not quite sure where it is you're going. You're not quite sure what your method, you know, the word method simply, simply etymologically means path. You're not quite sure where this path is going to lead you. There's a kind of stupidity to study an honest stupidity, an honest um, openness. You follow this path, this path may braid, it may break, it may open, there may, it may, it may be, there may, there may be other paths that lead off it. Maybe the path will stop, it will broaden. It will be like the waiting for Godot. It'll simply, you'll simply st stand there, uh, maybe with someone else, and, and, and talk. So method class can be a place where, you know, when educating postgraduates, method class can be that place where you don't know where you're going, and you don't know where you're going together. And you can you can talk about this and discuss um, the the impasses that that, that you, you meet when you when you when you study those moments which aren't productive which aren't um, which don't seem to lead anywhere. That non that non that non productivity could be something which could be perhaps folded back into academic work in some way. Um, perhaps this this non productivity could be something which you, which you write about and think about. My dream is always for postgraduate students. My dream is always that there's a creative element to any PhD. And the creative exploratory element is not necessarily that which we assess. What we, what we might assess as people who are marking a dissertation, who are examining a dissertation, would be a document which frames that exploration, a document which explains what it is we were trying to do, and perhaps we'd be honest about where it is um, we, we might have failed, where, where it is things that might, might have gone wrong. That was my dream of, of what it might be to be a PhD student to actually enter into a method, methodos, method, um, a, a lack of method, a methodlessness. That's the idea. So to actually um, fold this impossibility of, uh, of, um, of completing something, of um, focusing your mind, fold that into the productive process itself and producing a document which is exploratory, open-ended, and a document which goes alongside that, which is honest about the path, the breaking of the path, the interruption of the path, uh, what, might have, what might have happened. That's my dream, but this is something which the characters in my novel, who study um, in this department of stu disaster studies, this is what they actually do. Because even though they're being driven, they're being, um, they're being told by the character who's nicknamed Professor Bollocks, um, even though they're being told by this character how they are to approach their work, how they are to succeed, how they are to produce, they're always rebelling against that. They're rebelling against it, they're working against it, they're thinking against it, even though they're there listening to this man they nevertheless are um, opening up other non-productive um, spaces. And my character, Simone Vey, is doing exactly that. She's writing in her notebook. She's contemplating contr um, contradictions. So this is something which always happens, I think, in study. Whatever study you do, in, in, in whatever circumstance, there are, these, there are these moments which are anarchic, um, which are pathless, which 
are fruitless um, in the way you might understand um, understand them. So I think at the EGS, this, this will be part of study too. Now, the thing is that my university, my, my, the university called All Saints in my novel, there's a pretense that someone is in charge, someone's in command, that someone is, you know, the Professor Bollocks is the person who's going to tell you exactly how you're going to do things. You're going to write a PhD like this. These, these are the phases of your dissertation writing. These are what the chapters should do. So at EGS, there's a more open approach to these things. Likewise, where I work, the students I work with, PhD students, things are much more open. We're not, we're not trying to usurp the place of an authority here. And we're allowing our students, particularly in creative writing, actually, we're allowing our students to explore, to make connections, to have periods in which you're not particularly productive, periods in which you, you, you experience frenzy production. So that, I think, is, um, is what's crucial for me. That's, that's where freedom already is. Freedom is there. I th and I agree, Chris, in your diagnosis of, of, of postgraduate life. Freedom is there because you don't have this uh, bourgeois servitude yet, most of you, if you're studying. You know, you have, in some sense, um, very little to lose. And there's, there's no longer, you know, there's, not, there's probably not yet a mortgage, there's not yet um, commitments, uh, personal commitments of various kinds. So if, if you have a scholarship, I'm really thinking about here, people who are funded in some way, then you have this incredible period, this incredible period of openness, of exploration, but what you can do is simply relax, calm down, open yourself, and be stupid. So I think stupidity is something which can be embraced by the student very usefully. Um, it's part of the rhythm of study. The rhythm of study includes stupidity. Yeah, this is part of the, the breath work, the drifting of, of, of study. And that's what my fictional uh, um, university department allows. It's given these students uh, scholarships. They've come in uh, um, from, from the world out there. They've come in off the streets. They now have time. Time to do what? For my character, it's time not to finish, not to complete, to simply dwell in this intermediate state in, in what I call in the novel, what do I call it in the novel? Something about um, erotic, um, infinite erotic passion, or the infinite passion of Eros. I, can't, I have a phrase for it, it's quite good. But I forgot what that phrase is now. Infinite erotic passion. They simply dwell in that space of desire. And that, for me, then, is, is a utopia. As my own years were as a, as a PhD student, I, was, I had a scholarship. If you're free from the, 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 those financial pressures, then you, you step into utopia as a student. So thanks, mm -hmm. thanks very much for the question. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I feel that in, 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 your, in your presentation of it. And, and, uh, but also with this you know, quite ambivalent uh, 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 relation to, to, to fact, still the institutional structures that have to be have to be have to be have to be questioned and, and dismantled. I, I I would like to I I really appreciate this, Lars, it, and it's uh, I hope that was not too flat-footed that last question, but I just couldn't help it. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> given I suppose my own um, uh, uh, professional deformations and and my attempts at decreation. And so um, I, I wonder if there are uh, questions in in our audience for Lars. Um, is as any would anybody like to? Um, ask ask a question. Nemanja, you're able to see if there is anything, right? Yeah. At the moment, no. You can raise the virtual hand and I will be able to recognize if you have a question. Oh, wait a minute. Somebody just... <laughs> And that looks like, uh, well, yeah, that's you showing the hand, I think, Nemanja. Did you have another question? <laughs> no. Ah, here we are. Uh, here's Kathleen Ruiz, Chris. She has Great. a question. Kathleen. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if um, uh, you had thought about this really interesting phenomena that's happening globally. Mm -hmm. Uh, in China, it's called laying down, mm. and it's a certain kind of a, I, I, I don't want to call it a nihilism, but it is a, a certain kind of, um, the world is an amazing place. I don't want to um, work myself to the bone in order to sur survive. I will work a very sort of small, simple 
uh, job, have a very simple life. And um, yeah, it's, it's happening intensely in China right now. And I see sort of, there was something in The Guardian recently about 15-year-olds um, who um, uh, in England, uh, the, 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 the survey was like, a, well, we're never going to um, achieve economic independence, so why should we even bother? And of course, in the United States, we have some of this as well. And I was wondering if some of that sentiment might have flavored um, the book in some way, shape, or form. And I'm not really sure if this is stemming from, um, you know, fallout from the pandemic, the global pandemic or not, but I imagine it must have a role in, in there as well. Thanks, Kathleen. Thanks so much for that question. I didn't know about this idea of lying down. I like this idea very much. In the novel, in everything I write, I'm always thinking of um, how things once were in my experience back in the back in the 70s and 80s when the, when when things weren't as um focused or productive as as, as they're supposed to be now uh, there were still spaces in a city uh, manchester was full of these spaces you, you can go and squat you can live for nothing you just find yourself somewhere to live and you could you could pipe in electricity for free there seemed to be an awful lot of that in in our urban spaces here in the uk and in, in the city which i lived in in manchester for a few years that was very very present there's a whole lifestyle which went along with this. And part of that lifestyle could include study. In those days, study was free. And when you were supervising or being a supervisor, there was, there was far um, less interference by the university in terms of the structures you had to follow. Um, things were a lot easier. Uh, it, it, demands were placed on you to finish your work um, at, at, at a particular point. Now, this could have a downside in that people would simply drift on for years and never really do anything. But the upsides are precisely the same thing. People would drift on for years, not doing anything in particular. And that's how I remember Manchester being when I first arrived there in the late 80s, early 90s. I was living there. There's whole parts of the city which were pretty much left to do exactly what they wanted. And out of those parts of the city came enormous creativity. And that's in, in, in the novel. Um, there's, there's, a, there's, all, there's all these hymns to Squatland and the musical scene that arose out of those out of those places. In that period too, you could claim benefits without much interference. Now, if you're claiming unemployment benefit in the UK, there's all kinds of things you have to do, all kinds of um, all kinds of hoops you have to jump through. You have to apply for a certain number of jobs, and more than that, you have to be seen to apply for them. You have to go along to the job centre often, sometimes even every day, to 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 to, to, to apply for jobs. And this open world, this world of, of the dole, of welfare, of wandering, of drifting, of not having to worry too much about what, what it is you were doing, is something I think of with enormous nostalgia. I think that um, mode of existence that produces things, that makes music. We we're talking about Bristol earlier. I think of the conditions of music in a, in a place like Bristol as being quite similar to the conditions of music in a place like Manchester, or indeed any of the cities of the UK, which produced interesting and striking music. What you need is people allowed a bit of grace, people allowed a bit of time, people allowed time to drift, not this endless tightening up and this um, desire to make people produce and to work and to um, realise goals. So it's really a similar point I want to make about the postgraduate. The postgraduate dreaming and drifting is something incredibly important, but this dreaming and drifting is something which is important to all of us. The idea of living a creative life, where creativity is not about production, it's about some open-ended, I don't know what, an open-ended living, um, a bree an, an, an exhaling. So this, for me, is something which, which um, this idea of, lo of laying down Kathleen something which which I find um very interesting and this is this is the way in which you know you might engage with the world as what you call an amazing place the what's amazing is only only revealed when you longer no longer have that instrumental relationship to it and this is a topic I want to come back to actually um this is a to topic which I, I certainly would inform the next stuff I would write for the EGS it would be on this idea of um non-work non-productivity um, de souverain, as it's called in French, this idea of uh, worklessness. I think that'd be a topic which, which I'd write about. So, Kathleen, you're thinking very much along the lines which which I'm thinking about. Uh, 
Chris, there's a there's a question in chat. Oh. Should I uh, should I read it or would you like to do it? Go ahead. Okay, so it's a question from Gabriel uh, for Lars. Beyond our instrumental use of satire, as you put it, I'm wondering what you would say about the extent to which academic life and the persona of the, of the academic are portrayed in pop culture and as opposed to fiction. Does it indeed mainly lend itself to satire? And if so, why? Which is a very interesting question. It's something I haven't really thought about, actually. So satire in an instrumental sense, interesting, this, this expression of instrumental use of satire. Yeah, I mean, I think it, um, satire, I was saying earlier about satire being ameliorative, about correcting um, correcting issues, correcting foibles, satire being about lovable eccentrics. I think of the, back in the 80s, we had a television program over here. It's called A Very Peculiar Practice. And this was, uh, this was set in a university. It's actually a medical practice, if I recall rightly, that was set in a university. And in this medical practice, you'd see um, eccentrics of various kinds. And we, as television or as a television audience, would enjoy the, their, their bumbling. We would enjoy the eccentricities. We would enjoy the class of personalities. But um, I wonder whether, and this is a long time ago since I saw this program, whether that had more bite than that. And my worry is with academia, I'm thinking of, um, of you, you mentioned here, not just books, but also popular culture, um, uh, I, I'm thinking of Lucky Jim by Kingsley Amis. Um, I'm thinking of Malcolm Bradbury's books. Um, in these books, what, I, what, what disturbs me is the lack of recognition of the conditions uh, uh, that students and staff often face financially, the lack of financial prospects, the lack of um, career opportunity. So this is, for me, uh, part of one of the things that I'm, I, I try to write about is the fact you've got, you've got part-time faculty in the US who are living in cars, being paid by um, course they deliver, you know, earning whatever it is, less than $5,000 uh, per course, living hand-to-mouth. The conditions of labor in academia are such that this, for me, this ameliorative form of satire um, doesn't, really, doesn't really work. It, it's almost... Um, what's insulting really to the people who are suffering within the system part-time staff of course but also students who are part-time here in the UK we've seen fees rise enormously and of course in the US you have enormously high fees over there so when I think of um, academia and popular culture um, I, I, I don't really know much about popular culture I don't have a TV now you know I don't, I don't watch TV at all really so what I can think of things like Ross in Friends Who's a, I think he's a lecturer, he's a paleonto paleontologist. And it's all played for laugh, the amiable eccentric, the person whose attention drifts, the person who's, you know, he's got his nose in the book, this kind of thing. The conditions of academia, the conditions of labor, the conditions of being a student, I think, um, don't allow for me uh, enjoyment in that kind of satire. Satire here has to, go, has to be much more wild because these are, uh, this is a period of, of crisis, I think, in academia. So thanks, Gabriel, for, for, for the question. Nemanja, I noticed that uh, Nathan also has a question. Maybe we could end with that in the chat. Um, I think it's a question uh, that leads us toward Beckett, which is certainly territory that Lars will um, uh, be able to move in. <laughs> Can so you see Nathan, it, Lars? The yeah. yeah. Okay, so I have a question here. Nathan, thank you for this question. Um, reticence of Blanc showing and Dostoevsky in intellectual humility. Um, yeah, okay, so we think about um, this eros, this voicing. Um, how does it work in, in, in Beckett's work? Of course, Samuel Beckett, a uh, very close contemporary of, of Blanchot. Uh, what, what's interesting in Beckett's work, I always come back to this, it's one of these things which um, seems to obsess me, really, is, is that what's the nature of the obligation that makes Beckett write? There's a famous dialogue he has with, uh, I think it's George Dutuy, about the paintings, about the artwork of um, Talcote, uh, Talco and, uh, and Bram van Velt. And uh, one of the things that emerges in that dialogue, you know, Beckett talks about a very famous quotation, nothing to express, no means to express, no ability to express, but still the obligation to express. And the question of the obligation to express has always been very interesting to me in Beckett's work. You know, why does Beckett feel the obligation to express? For me, uh, the text which jumps out when I think about this obligation 
is the unnameable. The unnameable last in this what's called a trilogy, written in that period in the late 40s, early 50s, where Beckett, Beckett is, 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 um, is experiencing what is later called the siege in a room. It was the siege in a room where Beckett suddenly finds an ability to write. He has he writes Malloy, he writes Malone dies, waiting for Godot, he writes um, the unnameable. And in these texts, one of the things he, is, he explores is the nature of this obligation. Well, this this exploration, for me, in the unnameable, really um, reveals itself as such. The unnameable, we have barely any characters. We have these figures. We have Mahud. We have we have Worm. We have barely any narrative incidents at all. We have a monologue, and what this monologue is about, well, it seems to be about this obligation to express. Where does the obligation come from? It comes from without. It comes from a voice that the narrating voice claims has taken over his own voice. So the narrating voice um, claims to be possessed by this voice from outside. So when the narrating voice says I, it's not his I, it's the voice of this outside. When the narrating voice um, speaks of anything that's happened to him, it hasn't happened to him at all. It's something which comes from this voice from without. So this idea of um, a voice which simply um, demands to speak, taking over what you say, inhabiting what you say. This is, for me, what is so compelling about the unnameable in, in Beckett, which I've been thinking about again um, recently. So it's that kind of voice. But I think of other voices too. I think of the narrative voice that we find in uh, Blanchot's um, uh, Ressi, his, his narrative, his, his, his short uh, novel, uh, The Last Man. And what we get in, in that extremely interesting, peculiar um, fiction is a movement from the first person, something which is really quite hard to grasp. From the first person singular to the first person plural, to a we. The idea is, I think, for Blanchot, is that we as readers are caught up in this book. We're, really, we're caught up as readers in this experience, in the rhythms of this, of this text. And we as readers become part of this impersonal we, this what, this act of saying. And what is being said? A murmuring, a interminability, that which is without form. As with the, the unnameable by Beckett, what seems to resound here is something which, which we, we can't really put words to. A murmuring, a murmuring silence, a murmuring rustling, which is allowed to become present in the writing itself. I also think here of um, Juras, Marjorie Juras. I was looking at her work, and well, I, I meant to look at her work uh, this summer at the EGS, but we didn't, didn't have quite time to get there. There's something similar in her work too. And actually, in, 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 the, in the work I'm, I'm, I'm now trying to do fictionally, it's, it's of Duras I'm thinking of most of all, and what she's able to do with her fiction, with the spaces around, um, the spacings on, on, on the page, with her fragmentary sentences, with these voices that seem to come out of nowhere and, and, and fall back into nowhere. So these are, th these are things I think about, Nathan, um, when, I, when I read your, your question there in the chat. It's a voice which comes from outside, which is not, which doesn't admit of any particular personification, but a voice nevertheless to which one, one wants to respond. So one of my characters, at the moment she's called Priya, this is why I want her to access. The new novel, the novel in which I'm writing now, is about a merger of departments. It's about moving a philosophy department into a department of organizational management. And the novel is about inter interdisciplinarity. It's also about lovers. And one of the lovers is a philosopher, the other lover is an organizational manager. It's about how the two swap places, they change places. I'm thinking here of um, the, the, the film by Ingmar Bergman called Persona, where you find the characters uh, exchanging places. And that's what happens in this novel. The organizational manager undergoes what we might call with Deleuze a becoming philosopher. And I want her to become this voice where, where we get philosophy itself just speaking and speaking and speaking and speaking. But who knows? Who knows whether this would succeed? I'm, I'm writing this at the moment. I don't know whether this will carry through to the final draft, or even to the second draft, or even to the first draft, which I haven't quite begun. So who knows? But thank you for, for setting those um, thoughts in motion with your, with your question. It all depends on whose voice takes over, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, Lars, we've we've reached the uh, the time allotted for this session, so uh, perhaps um, that's a that's a beautiful place to to end. And um, again, I, I I've, I've enjoyed this immensely, and I want to thank you all of you for for participating. Um, uh, and everyone who's joined us, this is um, you know this is part of the study that you're talking about, and uh, I, I, a beautiful example of it. You know, entering this 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 strange space with you and uh, entertaining this, this 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 opening that 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 studying is. So um, let me yeah let me just thank you with uh, as, as warmly as I can, um, and I'll do that on behalf of the others. And I look forward to seeing you and uh, I say you, our audience, in um, uh, uh, other upcoming events. Uh, we have one. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll wait to announce these. Um, but <laughs> look out for our um, Malta seminars and workshop recordings. And uh, I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Thank you all. Thank you all for your questions. Thanks, Steve. Yes, thanks for inviting me. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Take care.